season finale of the you know one and only Sports Zone. I'm your host Ben Florence. This episode, we're supposed to be bidding adieu to my good friend Michael Gardner, seat to my left. But as you will see, seen in my left, Michael Gardner is not here because he decided not to tell me, but to announce via Twitter that he was retiring and made it clear that he go- was not showing up. Better than going so, on ESPN and announcing it. Okay, I thought that was funny. Fine. No, yeah, no, that was terrible. And you completely killed my momentum there. No. But yeah, Mike, you're an ass. Uh, but people that are that actually did show up because they care, uh, our good friend Jaron Berman. Hey. How are you, sir? Yeah, I'm looking fly. No, you're not. I'm not. And I'm next to him is uh, our good buddy uh, Dylan Schott. How are you, sir? I am not bad. Upset that it's the end of the season, though. Mm. It went really fast for, for the end of the season. What did you just say? I said rip, I like got RIP. Oh. No, no sports on football this year. Or no. basketball. We still have some time. We still got two more weekends basketball. left. And basketball. It's you know, speaking sport. of basketball, you know, I was uh, going in when I made the rundown. For the show, we were going to talk some NBA playoffs. But no! TMZ Sports <laughs> drops a bombshell Friday night releasing a tape of Los Angeles Clippers owner Donald Sterling saying some pretty... Pretty racist yeah. things. More yeah. to uh, to paraphrase, saying that to his girlfriend, which is interesting because he's married. Mm-hmm. But his girlfriend, Family values. who ironically is half African American, half Latina, Latina. Yeah. Yep. Uh, told her not to take not to take pic- not to associate with black culture, uh, to take pic- to broadcast her interacting with black people, bringing black people to. Magic Johnson. To uh, the Stable Center, Magic Johnson. Mm-hmm. And then earlier today, Deadspin uh, released a longer clip. I heard about Like a 10-minute like yeah. clip. We also talk about uh, her take a picture with Matt Kemp. And it's completely outrageous. The uh, the league, uh, Adam Silver on Saturday night, had a uh, press conference on the issue in, uh, in Memphis at the site of the, uh, the Thunder Grizzlies game. And he said that we're investigating the tape, and as of right now, we're not taking any uh, any measures. Although Sterling was not at today's uh, Clippers game, presumably because he was because it's the that's it, why they lost. Silver <laughs> Silver said that Sterling agreed that he would not go to the game today. So that means that somebody asked Sterling not to go to the game if, for him to agree yeah. to him. So they didn't suspend them, but they're basically like, yeah. Don't don't come. So they suspended with them without actually suspending. Jared, we talked about we this did. last night. We did. And uh, what's your thoughts on this uh, situation? It's basically the same as I told you yesterday. If you've been on the internet for the past year, two years, no matter what, you'll know Donald. Two Stur- years. Like I'm just saying. Five like, years. That's what I'm saying. You can go way back. Go, go way, way back. way back. Even since he became way owner back. of the league. Everyone knows he's the guy is a racist against not even just not against blacks against everybody. Yep. Like he literally is racist against everybody that is not white, and it's just it's I've, it, you literally can find it anywhere. Like even because he the way I think he got his money was I think he's a uh, real estate. Yes. He's big into real estate. real estate. So he would say like, these awful things about the people that live in his houses and just he even one thing I saw and it's that's brought up. He told Elgin Bale to run the team. Like a southern plantation. <laughs> this is so bad. Which, I, he, didn't, like, he doesn't even know, he didn't know who Elgin Bella was. He literally just said, he didn't know, he he didn't know who Elgin Bella was. Player. He was like, oh, okay, I guess my GM. All right, run the team like a plantation. How like, does that work? So, and Stern is known about it. The problem, I mean, you want to discuss, the problem with uh, that I can see here is Silver is Stern's protege, and Stern's biggest flaw, and what could, is his biggest downfall is he always bent over backwards for the owners. And Silver, if he he has, so has to be very careful now because this is his big te- this is his big test. This is like the fight. His what first he, big test. Like this is his first big test. Mm-hmm. If Silver doesn't, if Silver is going to bend over backward, it's just going to be Stern all over again, and this is just going to torpedo and just get worse and worse. And the Stern detractors are going to get louder and louder. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. They I do give a Silver a little bit of credit. I don't agree with what he did. I think he should have suspended. Yeah. But I will give Silver credit. I mean, you can tell the guy was a lawyer because he spoke very lawyerly. Oh, yeah. yeah. What an the answer process of the investigation go come through. Um, but it's like, well, here, here's how Commissioner Ben Florence would have done this. Let's hear it. Uh, Donald, was that you on the tape? 
If he says yes, then you suspend him. I mean, that's just incrimination. If he says no, then just say that, that he doesn't think that. But here's the funny thing, though. Sterling has, and his people have actually said it is him. It's just it was the, the, apparently the tape was altered or tailored, so it makes oh, him look yeah. bad. So he's basically admits it's his voice. Well, yeah. yeah. So anyways, and so the league has decided, at least not as of yet, they're going to take any sort of action. Dylan, what's your thoughts? Well, yeah. I mean, like you said, they recently just released another longer clip. Yeah. And I think it was even his wife or girlfriend. I'm not sure who yeah, it was. His girlfriend. That well, yeah, that's one or who was. That's one who he was talking to. But one of them came out today saying that even they admitted that it wasn't the full tape. That there was parts admitted from it. So, what, depending on what these parts are, depending how long this has to go on for, I mean, where they got these tapes from, everything like that. This could either be a very quick investigation. Just because of the way it's been unfolding right now, I think it's actually going to take a little bit longer. Um, I actually do like the fact that they asked him to not show up for the game today. I think just because this is so recent and it just broke, you can't immediately suspend him. But the fact, like you said, that they asked him not to show up, I'm assuming they're going to ask him not to show up to any more games this entire playoffs. So they're kind of suspending him without actually saying you're suspended, which I think is good. I think the full investigation is going to happen probably at the end slash after the playoffs, mm -hmm. but clearly, as you can see, this so this whole thing, investigation, speculation, everything like that, has already taken an effect on the Clippers with their d abysmal, absolutely abysmal performance today. Well, I wouldn't say absolutely abysmal. Golden State played very well. I mean, it was also Golden State's a good State. team, but you yes. do have to figure most of these games so far have been very close. Yeah. So the fact that they were down by, I think at one point they were at least down by 20 yeah. or more. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, they just didn't, the Golden State did play well. They played great defense all day mm -hmm. on the Clippers, but it'll see if this kind of continues and maybe affects them later on down the road. And what's interesting with Donald Stern, I mean, he, before he was known for being a racist, yeah. he was known for just being a terrible owner. The Clippers, ever since he owned the team, have been... More or less abysmal couple playoff seasons. But then the it, – it's, it's interesting. Uh, the old, Like uh, Adrian Wojnarowski of uh, mm -hmm. Yahoo Sports met, put a really interesting piece because people are like, oh, the players should do this or do that. The, it, this isn't the players. The players don't pick the owner. The other owners the, yeah. and the commissioner – are not only do that, but they've also basically were willing to be uh, embarrassed by this guy for X amount of years. And not only that, they remember the whole Chris Paul uh, situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The league vetoed a Chris Paul trade to Lakers, but it accepted one that put him to the Clippers. So it's a, it's a total mess. The guy's got to be suspended. I mean, even if ultimately if... He's somehow vindicated, which I don't <laughs> no, see. He, he no, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. No. I mean, it could happen. Up but you got to suspend him anyways if you're going to ask him to stay away from the games anyway. So you're basically, again, suspending him without suspending him. I know we have the lights on, but there's two things i got to add to that. One, you got, this has to be so much more considering him. He really took out an ad. For the Clippers, I don't know if you my guys still remember this, but he still got an ad for the Clippers game. It's like, oh, celebrating Black History Month in March. What yeah, that? I remember in that. March. You gotta, <laughs> and he has his face on it. He has his face on this ad. They like, oh, you know, it's like some deal. I forgot what a promotion was, but for in March, celebrating Black History Month. Yeah. Yeah. And I forgot the other point. Darn it. No, so. I'm sure it was irrelevant. Probably. But it, I do give, <laughs> uh, to, just to close out, uh, I do give the Clippers a lot of credit. They came out today. They didn't make a. They, they did the. Uh, they took the. They took the warm up. They uh, did. Over shirts off. Had their warm up shirts on, inside out. So they were playing. Thank you. Um, I know. Um, and but and ultimately they decide they decided to play yesterday. And honestly, I don't get why they shouldn't play. Yes, I understand. Thank you. Um, but and so. They, they, I didn't understand why they should not play because um, anything, they're just penalizing themselves. But yeah. we went a little over time, I presume. But uh, you are watching Sports Zone. We got some more action of our season finale coming up next. Welcome to Studio 90, the Sports Zone soccer segment. I'm joined by Mike. Gardner, no, I think he's been sent off for uh, two yellow cards, and Nate Papadis has also been sent off, so I'm alone. I'm literally alone, but that's all right, because now I can talk about 
Uh, Liverpool 0, Chelsea 2. Uh, this morning's uh, mid, mid-afternoon mid results, the, the big title shaker, so to speak. Um, Chelsea putting in a defensive display, uh, an organized defensive display against the Liverpool who were made to look utterly average. Um, Nick would probably say that it's Mourinho parking the bus, but for me it was, uh, it was a good performance by, by a Chelsea team that have a bunch of injuries right now. Um, Petr Cech has dislocated his shoulder, John Terry with a large ankle injury. Um, it was a good performance by a largely B, B side from Chelsea and uh, not much going on for Liverpool though. Luis Suarez today was, given, was awarded the PFA Player of the Year, Eden Hazard was nominated and awarded the PFA Young Player of the Year, so certainly interesting. And then pivoting then to Manchester City 2, Crystal Palace 0, Yaya Torre back from injury a couple weeks ago on Zone. We talked about um, Torre might be out of the World Cup, but he's back earlier than expected um, after sustaining a knee injury in that game. So two weeks out, he comes back, he assists the first goal, and he makes an, probably one of the best solo goals of the season, or solo run, really. Plays about four one-two passes up the field and then curls it, curls it in on his left foot. Um, Torre, for me, I think he should have been awarded the Player of the Year, but uh, I'm sure Nick would say otherwise, Mike perhaps as well. Um, so the title race is again alive in England, and really the odds are in Manchester City's favor. Uh, Chelsea would have to have Liverpool and City drop points with two games remaining. Liverpool, to win, would need to score a combined total of 12 goals in the last two games to, uh, to beat Manchester City in goal difference. So that'll be, that'll be an interesting race to follow. And now moving to the Champions League, which Tuesday sees Bayern Munich host Real Madrid. Bayern Munich holding, um, sort of, they're down 1-0. Real Madrid have won one goal to them. And that'll be, that'll be a really interesting tie because we have to see uh, Cristiano Ronaldo is back in the side. Karim Benzema is back in the side. That's pretty much a full strength Real Madrid side against the Bayern Munich team who have just been wrecked. One, by some inconsistencies in form, but two, uh, the passing of uh, Villanova. Um, Pep Guardiola's longtime assistant died of cancer at age 45, really, really tragic. Um, so Guardiola, that, that will certainly be on his mind. There was an image earlier this morning about uh, Guardiola, Bayern Munich scored their like third goal to win 3-2, or bring the score to 3-2, and Guardiola is just sitting there sort of really distraught. So. You know, he's certainly a human being, and he, has, he is a professional, but at the same time, it's going to be really, really difficult um, for, for their preparations. Uh, and then Wednesday, sees Ch- my Chelsea team host Atletico Madrid at Sanford Bridge. Uh, it's 0-0, so it's all to play for there. Um, I'm certain it'll be a very physical tie. Eden Hazard today, when he was accepting his PFA Young Player of the Year, uh, said he hopes to be fit for Wednesday, but we'll see. Sometimes those hamstring injuries, those muscle injuries on wingers can be kind of tricky. Um, so hopefully he gets some minutes, but that's a that's an Atleti team who can potentially win the Champions League and the Spanish League. Um, the Spanish League is still alive and on between Real Madrid and Atleti, so we will have to see where that goes. Um, in terms of preparations for the World Cup, Jurgen Klinsmann has said he knows just about his squad for the World Cup, but he still wants some players to be fighting. So I think he said he has his he generally has about. 20 or 19 or 20 players sorted, and there's about three to five that he wants to see uh, up, in, up until I think the end of May or beginning of May, middle of May, when he wants to uh, go ahead and go to the World Cup and select his roster. So with that, on a shortened segment, I have to do a solo run and try and score uh, just by myself because I've I've been abandoned. This has been Studio 90. Thanks for joining me on the final Studio 90. We'll see you hopefully um, early next semester, early August or so, whenever. Thanks for joining us on Studio 90. Hello and welcome back to Sports Zone. As I put my phone back in my pocket, uh, we got some uh, NHL Stanley Cup action to talk. Unfortunately, our nominal Stanley Cup expert Aaron Vale is across the pond, canoodling somewhere in Europe, and Mike Gardner is still not here. But we do have our good buddy Deepak Bagat. Who did eventually show up. I did, and that's my fault. And he's uh, wearing a nice vest. I get a little credit for that. Thank you. Excellent. Thrift and shop. Dylan is here. As, what did you just say? I got it at a thrift shop. Hey, did you really? This, this is the jack in the back, yeah. Well, it's how pretty, about that? Pretty, pretty handy. 
How about that? So we got some. Good, we've had some good Stanley Cup action thus far. Yeah, the Canadians swept that. The Lightning, uh, Boston Bruins advanced. Uh, the Blackhawks advanced earlier today by defeating the, the Blues. They won four straight in that series after the yeah. Blues took the 2-0 series lead. Um, they have the San Jose Sharks are up 3-2. Uh, Penguins are up 3-2 on Columbus. Deepak, what are your initial observations of the Stanley Cup playoffs this far? Yeah, I'm really liking how a lot of these series have played out. Uh, yes, you mentioned a few sweeps already. However, all these games, none of them are actually runaways. You had that one game against the Kings that was, you know, an absolute blowout, uh-huh. but that's been it for the most part. They're always back and forth. They're always very intense that I'm seeing this year. Um, one thing that I heard today, uh, prior to when the Blackhawks won, um, both coaches were talking about how it's a constant scrum. You know, they don't give an inch, uh, uh-huh. an inch to either team. Uh, and I really like how. In some games, in some cases, it's not the big name like first line players that are taking uh, mm-hmm. the stats. It's guys on the second and third lines. Dylan, what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I can tell you were uh, you had an excited nod when yeah. I mentioned the Bruins advancing in five. Yeah. Over the Red Wings, and they will take on the Canadians in the uh, second round. What do you? What are your uh, observations? in the first round thus far. No, I would definitely have to kind of agree with Deepak on that one with the fact that it's just been a very exciting NHL playoff so far. There's been a lot of games that have been very close and a lot of overtime games, which you really like to see in the NHL playoffs, and you really see that often. Especially this year, there's been a lot of those, a lot of down-to-the-wire games, and the series, especially the ones that are still being played, are getting drawn out. You had the Blackhawks coming back from 2-0, which adds some drama to it. You have the Kings starting to come back a little bit after being blown out in those first two games. But it's just, it's a really hard-fought game, and that's really what hockey is. Hockey's really a hard-fought game, and they're really showing it this season so far. All right, guys, so we're going to uh, trim a little time off this side because we went a little long on our uh, excellent uh, Donald Sterling discussion. So I'm going to put you guys on the spot. Who is going to be in the Stanley Cup final defect we got? Uh, Bruins and Sharks. Really? Yeah. I like it. Don't know what you got. Uh, I'm also going to have to go Bruins. I think that they're just going to just going to kind of carry the momentum. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to have to go I'm going to go Blackhawks again just to kind of a, a, a repeat kind of match up there. I think them coming back from down 2 and they really just are going to carry that momentum and kind of play with fire. You know, my pre-playoffs pick was uh, the Blackhawks and the Bruins in the final. So we got the I, same, I, same I thought right there. I hate you for stealing my picks. How dare you? But I am going to pick the same thing. All right, guys, quickly again, who's going to win? And thus, who and then will allow us to mock you when we return in the fall? Who's going to win the Stanley Cup? Pains me to say it, but it's gonna be the Bruins. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to stay with some hometown pride right there. I'm gonna go Boston Bruins. You know what? I refuse to partake in any of that. So the Blackhawks are gonna win it all. My moron friends at the University of Missouri that love the Blackhawks or say they love the Blackhawks. We'll be excited. So that is it for our NHL uh, extravaganza. We got some more greatness coming along the way in our season finale. You're excited. I'm excited. And, uh, yeah, we got some more sports on on the way, so keep it locked. Hello, and welcome back to Sports Zone. This is your one and only baseball segment. I mean, that is, unless you don't include throwing it up. And, I, yeah, but this is the one and only baseball segment. We are joined by three people here today. We got Deepak, Dan, and... Oh, Gardner wasn't here. I forgot about that one. Gardner still didn't show up. Oh, yeah. Forget Gardner, we got these two guys, our local baseball experts, to join me here talking about all the biggest news that we have in sports. And we're going to start off with Michael Pineda of the New York Yankees, suspended for 10 games by Major League Baseball for using pine tar, all that sort of stuff, using it to grip the ball. We all know a few weeks ago he used it against the Boston Red Sox. He had it on his hand that then moved to his arm. After the game, he said that it was only some dirt. You know, he was sweating. He... He touched the ground, he got some dirt on him, no big deal. This past weekend, or past week, pitches a game against the Red Sox again. He ends up with some pine tar in his neck. John Farrell has the umpires check it out, see it's pine tar, he gets thrown out of the game. Deepak, what do you think about Pineda using pine tar twice against the Red Sox? He's an idiot, I'm sorry. (laughs) You know, 
He's a great pitcher. I'm not gonna lie. He, stuff that we saw him do in Seattle like was unbelievable for yeah. for a young kid. However, I think you know, at the point it is now, pine tar is not allowed for pitchers, and you know it's plain and simple. But I think in a few years they need to start adjusting that because we've all seen it. The rosin bags is there to help you when it's really hot, but when it gets cold, if you're pitching in September, that's just powder. That's not gonna help you. It's actually gonna like probably worsen your grip on the ball, mm-hmm. and so. You know, you're going to need to have some sort of substance to help you out there. Like, what are they going to do when they're when they're on the bench in between innings? Like, you know, heat up their arms somehow and then get the rosin on there? I don't know. But, you know, I think if pine tar, as it is now, is still uh, for, uh, for batters, you know, the one guy that comes to mind is George Brett. Yeah, of course. Um, eventually, you're going to have to adjust and in a few years let pitchers start coming up with stuff to help themselves out, you know, when, when – it comes time to get out there and actually locate the pitcher. Okay. Pitches. Yeah. Dan, how do you see this changing, whether this year, upcoming year, or a few years down the road? Do you see them becoming more lenient on pine tar and stuff like this? Um, I think I certainly think it's a possibility. I know I saw, I think, an article. It was on probably Yahoo Sports. I think today, actually, they were talking about it, uh, saying similar things that Deepak said, actually, that, you know, it, it's an old rule, and, you know, it was they brought it in to prevent the spitball and all that kind of stuff, you know, pitchers keep Vaseline on the brim of their cap and all that nonsense, but, you know, again, if you're just using it to get a grip, it, you know, I think it'll be a little bit more lenient, but I still think they're going to try to limit the the ability of the pitchers to kind of alter the flight path of the ball with this substance. So it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a thin line, but I think they're going to have to move closer to the line. Yeah, it's definitely a very thin line, and obviously, I mean, if you start allowing them to use pine tar... It's going to be how much can they put on the ball? Is that too much? Is it affecting the ball? All that sort of stuff. I do see them trying to do something. A lot of people have said that Japan, they have baseballs that they use that they can just open them up. They don't rub them with anything. As you know, Major League Baseball rubs their baseballs down with like mud from Mississippi to remove that glossiness at first. So apparently in Japan, they don't do that at all. They take them out of the box and use them. So it's maybe doing something like that. Maybe you do some sort of rosin mixture. I know... Everyone keeps mentioning that Clay Buckholtz and John Lester from the Red Sox last year were found with foreign substances, and they both said people use it, but they both said that it was just rosin, and you could clearly tell it was like a white paste that they, that I think uh, Buckholtz had it on his arm, like it was sweat, it was sweating, and yeah. he put some rosin on his arm and then took it off there. So something like this, some things that need to be developed, or Pineda just needs to get a little bit more tricky with it. I don't, I don't know if he goes all Ed Harris from Major League Baseball. Yeah hiding the chili pepper up his nose and stuff stuff like that. You have to see what happens with that. But turning from there, we're going to go a little bit a little bit looking down the road now. And we're not going to be here for the summer. That's when most of the baseball season is going to be played. So we're looking towards the end of the year now. End of the year, playoffs, World Series. I want some early World Series predictions from you guys. Obviously, it's hard to predict an entire season like this. But, Deepak, if you want to start it off, who do you see the two teams being in the World Series? I see, as of now, the Cardinals and, and the Tigers. Um, you know, the Cardinals are always, always a powerhouse. You know, they got, they got pitching, they got hitting. They fared well without Pujols. It's terrible to say, but they have. Yeah. Uh, you know, yes, they miss his influence and his leadership. But they've really done well, and I think this young team just keeps getting better. They had a great game today. They shut out the Pirates, eight nothing, I believe. I think um, so, yeah. You know, and the Tigers, then the AL, are always powerhouse. You know, uh, yes, Miguel Cabrera is struggling right now. Yes, they did trade Prince Fielder, but they got a great second baseman in Ian Kinsler, mm-hmm. who he has jinxed those Rangers. <laughs> um, I don't know how they're doing right now, but you know, he really hopes that they don't win ever yeah. again. But as of now, I do see it being those two very balanced, very strong teams going far. Of course, there's always the dark horse that can make it out somewhere. Of course. You, know, you never really can tell what's going to happen this yeah. early in the season. Okay. Dan, who do you think is going to make it to the World Series? Um, I'm going to agree with Deepak's American League pick. I like the Tigers as well. I think I said it a few weeks ago on a different episode. Uh, they were my team to watch in the AL. I do like the Tigers. Um... Miguel Cabrera, Ian Kinsler, uh, Nick, Cast- Nick Castellanos, I think, their third baseman now. Yeah. He's having a pretty good start to his year, um, so he's someone, a, a, like a young guy to watch going forward. Um, and even without Peralta, th- I think they'll figure out that shortstop situation um, and they'll get that going. The National League is, is trickier. Um, I think the Cardinals will be 
um, good. I think it's good to watch the NL West. Um, Tigers and Giants, one and two, only a game apart right now. And I really, and this is gonna, this pains me to say, but I, the Atlanta Braves are playing phenomenal baseball right now. <laughs> playoffs come, they're not. Playoff comes, they're not. They're not. They historically have failed. Um, and, and I kind of think that's gonna continue. You know, Aaron Harang is not gonna pitch to a no. under one ERA the rest of the season. But. Uh, they could be your dark horse team, but I, I think the NL West is going to be the division to watch. I think if the Dodgers get it going, uh, they can make a run. So you think it's going to be Tigers and Dodgers? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to be a little bit different than both of them. Um, as for the American League, I mentioned this last week when I was kind of wrestling with Ben about who I thought was going to be from the, from the American League. This week, I'm leaning towards the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim coming out of the AL West. Uh, I really think the way that Pujols is hitting right now, I think he's going to keep it up for the rest of the season. Trout, you know, if he can keep it up like he's done for the past two years, he's going to be great there. They got solid pitching. They got C.J. Wilson, who's doing really well. Jared Weaver. Tyler Skaggs has been a pretty surprise pick, and they definitely focused on their pitching this past season. They kind of dumped off some of their bigger guys. They dumped off Trumbo. They lost Peter Borges. But they've added a lot of pitching because that's what they realized was part of their weakness. And I think once Hamilton comes back, we'll see what happens with his shoulder slash hand injury. But he was batting 440 with, I think, three home runs. and like It was early in the season, but he was on fire early in the season. So if he can continue that once he gets back, I really think the Angels are going to be a hard team to beat. As for the NL, I do think it's going to be those Atlanta Braves. No. I just think they have they have way too much talent on their team to fail. I know you say this every year. Same argument for me for the Dodgers. Same argument. But they have Gatis behind the plate. He has huge power, and he's won quite a few games recently with some walk-off hits. You got Freddie Freeman at first, Andrelton Simmons at short, Chris Johnson if he can go and bat above 300 again, Justin Upton, BJ Upton, Dan Ugla. Jason Hayward. Jason Hayward. He's been struck with. Jason Hayward's been struggling. Upton's been struggling. Yeah, yeah been struggling. Th- those are the three. Upton, those, those are always the Ugla. three weak points. But BJ Upton started using glasses now. He's thinking that that might help. Even if that bumps him up 50 <laughs> points, when you think, oh, it's not that much. But that bumps him from like batting 210 right now to 260. So we'll see what happens there. They're pitching strong. Once they get back some of their pitchers, too, they're going to be carrying. I really think those are going to be the final two. But we'll see what happens with that. Maybe our predictions will be right. We'll see what happens over the summer. Anything can happen. Trade deadline, anything from there. But for the last episode of the season, of the semester, this has been Getting to Third Base. I am your host, Dylan Choate. Enjoy the rest of the episode, guys. All right, welcome back to Sports Zone. As you can tell, Mike Gardner... Still deciding not to show to his final episode, so Mike, actually I was going to say you're in our hearts and our spirits, but neither of which are true right now. <laughs> He's so. not here, so. we got the great D.L. Dan Lignato with us, uh, yeah. who is uh, a co-worker of Mike's. I, yes, I, well now, now a former co he, well, that's Our last right. game, is, we're, that's right, he's done now. <laughs> that's right. Did he show up to the last game? He that did, he did. I'm he did shocked. He, uh, I'm shocked. Yeah. Wow. But Big anyways, lax. we're going to start with a little baseball talk. This is all in all, so we're going to talk something and then talk something completely different because, um, I don't know. So, first segment, or first topic, rather, Albert Pujols, uh, last week in Washington, D.C., no less. Yeah. And ironically, Mike Gardner was at the game, so it would be great if he was here to give us his insight, but again, he's not here. So, we're going to talk a little uh, Albert Pools. Uh, last week, last Tuesday, he got his 499th and 500th home run in the same game. He's been off to a torrid start thus far, Dan. Uh, what does this say for him after two relatively disappointing years? And what about him all time? Uh, well, of course, you mentioned two pre- disappointing years. I think that was a lot of that was injury problems. Um, it certainly looks, I mean, in the early going, that he's kind of regained to, to the form that he had in St. Louis that earned him... Uh, his, his mega contract that he got from the Angels. Yep. Uh, they got some money to throw around. Um, in terms of all time, that kind of is, is tough to say. I mean, we know he's at, I think, 501. I think he had another home run the other day. Um, he is 34, though. Yeah. So he, time is not on his side in terms of getting to that upper echelon 700-plus home runs. 
Um, I, I think I do think you know it's easy to see him go down as one of the better sluggers of all time. I don't know if he reaches that that upper plateau. Uh, Dylan, what are your thoughts? Uh, so he's at five hundred one. He's thirty four. Yeah. So uh, could he possibly crack six hundred? Uh, you know, if he plays five more years, you would think yes, maybe. Yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, where he stands potentially all time? In terms of uh, sluggers. Yeah. Um, I definitely think he cracks 500. I mean, 600. I mean, you have to think, even if he plays five more seasons, putting him into 39, that's 20 home runs a season. And he's already has the rest of this season. Plus, I think he could probably go six more, um, depending, again, on how he holds up. He has been had a lot of injuries recently. I know he had the foot injury last year, and that really took a lot away from his power numbers. He really didn't have a good stance and a good base there. And you could just tell with his swing. As for one of the, like, how what how is he ranked among the greater hitters? I mean, he's the 26th guy to reach the 500 home run club. Yep. I think he's going to get to that 600 home run club. Hey. So we'll see how that happens. I think you have to put him up there in the discussion as one of the greater greatest hitters of all times. Just because if you look at what he did with St. Louis, he was consistently over 300, over 30 home runs, and over 100 RBIs. I think his last season in St. Louis was the only season with them that he didn't do that. Yeah. And he hit, I think it was 32 home runs. He batted 299 and had 99 RBIs. So he was like one hit away from reaching that next point of continuing that through his entire career in St. Louis. He's been injured these past few years. If he can get back to that, which I think he can. I honestly think he can, especially with what he has around him in the lineup in the Angels. I think he could be considered one of the greatest hitters of all time. And it was uh, what uh, it's always so refreshing about Pujols is that there's no steroid taint around him. I mean, yeah. although we do love taint. But on that note, we're going to move to the NFL draft. <laughs> Which actually, uh, by traditional schedule, would have happened this past Thursday, but there was a scheduling conflict at Radio City Musical. The NFL moved it back two weeks, which could be permanent. I hope not, because it just sucks. But anyways, so the NFL draft will happen after we are done here at school, that Thursday after the last day of finals. But uh, we're not going to do a whole NFL draft preview because we just don't have the time. I wish we could. Go to my website, bflow360.com, for all kinds of <laughs> draft coverage. Ooh. Cheap plugs galore. But, it, you know, there's so much talk about every draft, franchise quarterbacks. It seems like there have been so much, like, uh, talking and discussion about these quarterbacks. Maybe they're good, but maybe they're not. Franchise quarterbacks, you got Teddy Bridgewater, uh, Johnny Manziel, Derek Carr, Fresno State, Blake Bortles. And then you go beyond that to another step down to like Tom Savage, Jim Garoppolo from Eastern Illinois, mm-hmm. which is Tony Romo's alma mater. So, Dylan, if you had to pick one of these guys to be a franchise quarterback in the NFL, who would you pick? I have to pick one to be a franchise quarterback? Uh, or or you could pick whoever you think are franchise quarterbacks. Right. Could be. Um, I'm just going to lay it out there right now. I don't. S- there's a lot of depth among these quarterbacks. I don't see any of them being a solid franchise quarterback. And the way I say that is when you look back over the past few years, you look at Andrew Luck, you look at Robert Griffin III, you can even, I guess, stretch it a little bit more to go look at Sam Bradford, but he really hasn't had that good of seasons yeah. with the Rams. But I don't see any of the players in this draft competing with them. Yes, you think of Johnny Manziel, the big, high, high-powered, high fast, everything like that, but you hear everything, the undersized, the attitude issues, everything like that. Even Robert Griffin III coming off as early as he did, people were worried. Is he going to be able to adapt? Is he going to get injured? He gets injured. It's something that you see with running quarterbacks, which is why Johnny Manziel, for me, is definitely not a franchise quarterback because it just takes one hit, one hit to end end his season there, and you'll see if he can get back on that. But to be fair to Robert Griffin III, it wasn't a hit that got him. It was just a shoddy, awful turf. What? But no. But it was the the hit against the Ravens when his knee bends back that well, injures yeah, his knee. But it, what what really hurt him was against though the the game the playoff game. Yes. But well, that's what ends up I like see what ending you're it. Com- yeah. So, so, but for the quarterbacks there, I think there's a lot of solid quarterbacks. I think that they're going to be leading the leading the league in some stats, maybe a Pro Bowler for a year or two. 
but I don't think any of them are going to be a long-term f- franchise quarterback. Dan Legnano, quickly, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I don't disagree with Dylan. I think I think he makes some good points. Of the top three that we mentioned, Manziel, Bridgewater, and I guess Bortles is the third. Yep. I, I, I kind of like Bortles. I just think he's going to uh. be more durable just because he's bigger. Um, we talked about Manziel, Bridgewater, six foot and six two. They're kind of undersized. I think one hit from a middle linebacker, and you know you're looking yeah. at concussions galore. Um, I like Bortles. The comparison with him is Ben Roethlisberger, which is mm-hmm. a great comparison to have. Um, two Super Bowl titles for Roethlisberger early in his career too. Um, so yeah, but I don't disagree with Dylan. I think he's he's got a pretty good point. He's pretty pretty right there. Talking fast there, like a true Long Islander. <laughs> I like that. They they flashed us. They said we're, we're they did flash us. Um, well, not that way. Yeah. But um, <laughs> beyond my terrible innuendo, we got more Sports Zone on the way, so keep it locked. Hello and welcome back to Sports Zone. This is your one of your favorite segments that you have on here because I know it and you guys all know it. This is Shin to Chin with Brian Shin joining us right now. We're going to be talking all of that UFC MMA action. And this is coming at a great time because we had a huge fight night last night on Saturday. We're going to start from the bottom up with the big fights, and we're going to start with the Luke Rockhold fight versus Tim Bosch. And now going into this fight, you know Tim Bosch is dangerous. Rockhold's been on fire recently with some of his <laughs> fights, and he ends up getting a quick submission in this fight. Do you want to explain what happens in this, Brian? Yeah, so actually Luke Rockhold is actually a very capable fighter. He fights out of the same gym as uh, Daniel Cormier and uh, Cain Velasquez, so you know that he's wrestle ready. Yeah, you know? he, he always is. I mean, he's he's a that. tough guy. Um, that being said, his striking is fantastic. Um, he, he's looked very sharp on the feet. Um, ever since he lost to Vitor Belfort, I think he's been really tightening up his game. Tim Bosch uh, showed up, ran straight for a takedown, and uh, Luke Rockhold was he was just on top of his game. Hit the switch, broke his toe. Actually, I Rockhold found out. Did? He broke his toe in the very first seconds of the fight, hitting the oh, switch. Wow. Uh-huh. And okay. then uh, he was able to get an inverted triangle into, and he was threatening three different submissions. He was threatening, I think, an omoplata, a triangle, and a kimura. He finished with the kimura. Yeah. Um, you know, just real good tenacity on that submission. So he looked very good, uh, very good that night, and I think he deserves a top five opponent. Yeah, no, and like you said, that submission was just the way he caught him in that submission. Goes for the takedown, and you see the triangle set up, but it was just completely different than you'd ever seen it, mm-hmm. and he just slowly was working him and ends up catching him in the Kimura. He spins, Bosch can't get out of it. He gets a little bit of distance away from the cage, and then he just catches yep. him, and it's, it's over from there. But that was a very quick fight. Didn't really take too long. It was within the first round that all of that happened. The next fight, though... It went the full three rounds, and this was the Phil Davis versus Anthony Johnson fight. The big news about this is Dana White called out Phil Davis before the fight, saying how he's not really there mentally, how he's a good fighter, but he's not there mentally. He's not going to be able to one day like fight John Jones and actually beat him. Anthony Johnson, the storyline behind that one, is he's finally coming back to the UFC. He been hadn't been fighting for a while, mm-hmm. and when he was fighting, he was fighting out of the 170-weight class. Yes. This fight he fought at 205. Mm -hmm. Big, big difference there. But the biggest reason for that is because he always had problems cutting weight. He ends up coming to this fight and destroys Phil Davis through most of this fight. Yeah, so for Anthony Johnson, I I believe he's 6-0 in his last fights outside of the UFC. Uh, which is impressive, but you know, he's definitely fighting competition that's not as, as, uh, as good in the UFC. That being said, Anthony Johnson was, I think his... Weight class, natural weight class is 205 is perfect. Um, he was fighting at 170. He was struggling to make 170. Um, he was outpowering everyone at 170. <laughs> now he's a naturally strong person, so he wanted to fight then at middleweight. Couldn't make weight at middleweight. He came in at 197 out of 185 pounds at middleweight against Vitor Belfort and then lost to him. Yeah. And then now he's at 205. I think he cuts less than Phil Davis just by a little bit. But it doesn't really matter because Anthony Johnson is just so strong. And we really saw that he really had no respect for Phil Davis' striking. Phil Davis being a very good fighter, um, looking okay with all the volume strikes against Machida. Um, but Machida's a smaller opponent. Anthony Johnson is a pretty big, strong guy. He hits with he devastating power, not with just counter strikes like Lyoto. And we can really see that uh, Anthony Johnson didn't really have the respect for... Um, for uh, 
Phil Davis is striking, and he was just walking through his punches and, and lighting them up all night. Yeah. Phil Davis did not look that great, to be honest. He really didn't, and I mean, Phil Davis really wasn't hitting with a lot of power. You mentioned mm-hmm. Anth- Anthony Johnson got a lot of big shots in on him, mm-hmm. which was surprising. I mean, yeah. he's a powerful guy, though, yeah. so it makes sense. Quick, too, even at 205. He was surprisingly quick. Yeah. I, didn't, I thought Phil Davis was going to be faster than him, mm-hmm. especially because Phil Davis has been fought, fighting at this. He's a really good wrestler. Yeah. And Johnson stopped all the takedowns, yeah, too. Yeah, easily. Yeah. yeah. He really did. So Johnson looked really good in this fight. We'll see what happens next with him. I don't know if there's talks about who he's fighting next. I don't know. Probably a top five opponent. That Phil Davis is a big step up, so. I mean, Phil Davis, I think, was five already, yeah. maybe. So Johnson will definitely step up, and maybe if he keeps winning, get a shot at Jones soon. Definitely. Speaking of John Jones... He also fought last night, and this was the John Jones versus Glover Teixeira fight. Everyone knows John Jones. He had 13 straight, or the 12 straight victories, six straight title defenses. John Jones, tall, lanky, throws a lot of elbows. But then you have Glover Teixeira, 20 straight wins. So this was the two heads of. I mean, it was it was a pretty big fight. It wasn't any super fight like mm-hmm. they're kind of predicting. Yeah. But in the end, Jones just completely. Out muscles Glover Teixeira. He really just threw a lot of elbows in there, cut him up a lot, dealt a lot of damage to Sh- Teixeira, and Jones ends up winning this fight. Brian, quickly explain this one. So quickly, I guess the story of the fight here was that John Jones was more creative. He was more dynamic. Teixeira only wanted to box. He couldn't get Jones to the ground. Um, and you know what? You can't really do that at the higher echelons of the game, echelon of the game, because these guys are trained well in everything. Gustafson could exploit John Jones, but um, for a guy who's shorter, who's a bigger power striker, you know, he really needed to throw in some leg kicks. He really needed the Muay Thai plum. He needed to do something, and he needed to sep- set up his takedowns, things like that. And um, like I said before, I think the key to beating Jones is to put him on his back and really beat him up, but yeah. we've yet to see that happen. We haven't seen that happen. Hopefully we see it happening soon. Brian last night was saying he really wants to see another jones Guftison fight. Hopefully we get to see that soon, but this is going to be a long hu- summer hiatus for us. Brian and I are going to be watching the fights all summer. I hope you guys keep watching those fights, but remember, you got to watch out for those elbows, but keep it locked for more sports zone. This is now our uh, final thumbs up, thumbs down of the semester of the year. So cue emotional reaction, how they may be. Uh, This was going to be the final segment in the sports zone career of Michael Gardner. But again, if you haven't gotten the memo or if you just tuned in, Mike decided not to show up because that's just the kind of man he is. But we got our good buddy Alan Wynn here. Looking very fine. Always. Always. Unlike the man on camera right now. Never classy. It's a shambles. He's he's a total goon. But we're going to kick off thumbs up, thumbs down, as we always do with Mr. Dylan Show. Take it away. Hey, started up this week. We're going to go thumbs up. Um, I know I said this last week. It was the Chris Colabello, player for the Twins, first baseman, outfielder, slash DH. Um... (laughs) But I would like to give a thumbs up there. Uh, he's been actually getting a lot, a lot of coverage now on ESPN, MLB.com. Uh, ESPN Fantasy Baseball has him almost at 100% ownage, which, I mean, like I've said before, he played with the Worcester Tornadoes. I've seen him play. Uh, I took batting lessons with him through Little League and uh, Babe Ruth level. So great job to him. Plus, he hit a home run on his mom's birthday when they were interviewing her. I don't know if you guys saw that at all. I suggest checking it out. But she uh, she was being interviewed. They were talking about how Chris, and then as they did it, boom, he hits a home run, which I think was was a great story right there. Another thumbs up um, is going to go to UFC fights on Saturday. I'm saying Saturday, even though they were last night. Uh, Brian and I went out. We watched them. We got one of our friends to join us out watching the fights. A, there was a good set of good set of fights. A good Why card. Did you invite me? What the hell? <laughs> we didn't think you were around. It's okay, Ben. That is hey, you're here for the summer. You, yeah, me, and Brian yeah, can watch some UF, UFC That's fights. Well. But uh, it was a great Excuse great me? set of cards. You heard us talking about them earlier in the segment, so you saw us talk about the Luke Rockhold sh- submission, all that sort of stuff. But it was just a great overall night. Thumbs down though is going to be to the end of the sports zone season it yeah. was it was definitely 
a very rough, one of our harder years, I would say, here at SportsZone. Better than last year, though. Okay. I would, I would definitely agree with that one. I'll say with um, that. It would definitely went a little bit smoother, and I know what you're talking about. Mm. But this year, we had some issues with, like always, camera issues, technical <laughs> issues, some issues with just not having enough people sometimes. We were missing some key components throughout the year. Gardner didn't show up to a lot of them. We were yep. missing Erin Vale, so I'm hoping she's coming back Mr. next Silas year. Hill. Silas Hill as well. So we were missing a lot of key contributors there. But I know. We're going to start uh, next semester when we get pick it back up in the fall. We're going to be having a lot of returners. I'm really hoping that we can get some new recruits out there. Rush, so any some Rush freshmen, sports, uh, sophomores, yes. even some juniors that are out there, sports, that if you guys want to jump in for a year, there's lots of great opportunities, and I'm really looking forward to next semester, guys. Excellent. Beautifully done. Mr. Wynn, what do you yeah. got? All right. First off, thumbs up. Uh, I'm going to mention this in the solo soccer segment, if you've already watched it, because um, you had to. Uh, this, Absolutely. This has been the best English Premier League season for me so far um, that I that I have watched. Even though Chelsea, my favorite team, might not win the league, the narrative of the season throughout uh, Luis Suarez, Liverpool, um, just exploding onto the scene. Uh, Manchester, Manchester City. <laughs> Suarez, actually, did he just he got Player of the Year? Hey! hey. hey. Today. Boom! Money um, shot. Man City playing really well. Manchester United, the shambles that that team is and that organization <laughs> is, and how fickle their fans are in real life, as you can tell by the lack of Facebook statuses um, when they when they win because they don't win. Um, <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs up to this Premier League season. It's been incredible. The narrative. Um, thumbs up to NBC for hey, hey. Their, coverage. their coverage has been absolutely wonderful. Um, for a lot of years watching Fox, you know I still love Fox. Fox soccer. Watching Fox yeah. soccer is really difficult because uh, they sometimes didn't air games on every channel and. and NBC has made it really easy for American fans to watch Wait, the game. you didn't love Eric Winalda? Uh, I do not like Eric Winalda. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because, I mean, you have Eric Winalda, and now you have Rebecca Lowe. She's, She's a great. gem. She's a gem. She's She's a Rebecca gem. Lowe. Um, like Sharon. Sucks. No, he's terrible. Yeah. So, thumbs, up, thumbs up to NBC Sports. Thumbs down to people who never play pickup soccer and think it's okay to step on me really hard because I am, like, in a lot of pain. Right now, uh, yesterday it was a beautiful day. Yesterday, like seventy degree weather, out on out on the green concrete that is uh, Jacobs Field, <laughs> and uh, you know just playing playing some pickup with some kids. Nick Papadis, who is not here today, the late playing, Nick some, <laughs> playing some pickup with him, and uh, these kids they just they just don't really know how to control the ball. They get a little little uh, ambitious, and they they go in for a tackle, and I have like a big purple bruise on my leg. I'm missing my left toenail again because some kid decided it was. Okay, to stomp on me. So, you know, thumbs down to that, but thumbs up. My final on a on a good note. Anyone on a good note? My first uh, season of sports. Hey, hey, it's been really really wonderful. A successful you guys. Some diff difficult times, but you know, you learn you learn through adversity. So um, thumbs up to sports on Aaron Vale, Silas Hill. You guys are abroad, but um, you know, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Oh, oh yeah. I'm blushing. <laughs> All right, so. Bidding My oh. We had a cake, and we had we, we had didn't. streamers that were come down from the sky. confetti too, right? Don't we did that? Like the confetti, the balloons, they're gonna the uh, play stars and stripes forever. It's gonna be <laughs> but. great. But he didn't show. So thumbs down to that. Uh, uh, first real thumbs down to so on. Friday, my strategies and trust management class. The professor, and he actually told us at the beginning, of the semester he wasn't gonna be here. He was at some conference. So we had some like personal trainer from somewhere in that department and we like had this grueling class of all kinds of physical activity <laughs> my legs are still sore today <laughs> sunday a little bit it was two days ago so thumbs down to Do that you even lift, bro? Uh, i don't lift and but i mean it was all like running around and doing leg ups and all kinds of hoot nanny uh second or third thumbs down just gonna go to cbs and cbs radio <laughs> So one of my favorite YouTube channels was WFAN Audio because they would go and they would transcribe and uh, put up audio of, well, not just the Mike, uh, Mike Francesa, the, the sports pope himself, as I'm just spitting everywhere, but, um, and as also the, some other moments, uh, Joe Badigno didn't know he had a quad, uh, Boomer and Carn shenanigans, all that jazz. And thus, on Friday... CBS decided, uh, well, we uh, copyright infringement, 
Because, you know, technically, it, I guess it is, but it was an effective way, and not only was it a hilarious channel, for, for it was the best way to promote the show. Because, and the guy that did this channel, like some other channels, loved Francesa, loved the show, and defended on Twitter and all that jazz. You had Fra, the Francesa Con, all that action. And so now it's, it's, it's no more, so we have to rely on Fox Sports, because he's on Fox Sports oh. 1. Right. What channel is Fox Sports 1? It's, uh, no one knows. We don't, have, one, it no, we so. don't have it here. We don't have it here. It's channel knows. 219 on DirecTV at DirecTV. Uh, I don't have any other Fox thumbs up. Uh, thumbs up to the year of Sports Zone. My first full year without having the pro- the producer leave. Yeah. We still love you, CED, even though nobody knows where you are right now. So. R.I.P. CED. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, it was a trying year, but I enjoyed it. Uh, had some fun, had some laughs, made fun of people, <laughs> myself. <laughs> and I just spit earlier. I'm a little more spill, so that's just gross. <laughs> um, another thumbs up is going to go to, well, uh, I'm excited for summer. I'm going to be I'm gonna be home for a little bit. I'm going to be doing interning here, get a little mix and match. We living the immortal Burks, which is gonna oh. be great. We love the Burks. I live there now. Love. <laughs> Do you really? You moved there. Yeah, I moved there. I thought you were in. Uh, I don't know why we're at. we're not gonna. No, nah, not here. Um, and so thumbs up to everyone that helped out on the show this year. I can't think of any other thumbs up right now. Um, uh, yeah. So for everyone here, Sports Zone, you guys are great. I love you all. Uh, to well, not. To yeah. Um, and for everyone at ATV, thank you for watching Sports Zone. Thank you for sticking through all our shenanigans. And yes, Dad, I know we've had audio problems. So when you pick me up, you can let me know. And yes, he does that pretty good. Cool. But uh, my dad's a great guy. He loves the show. Mom loves the show. My ex wife loves the show. Still? Uh, Got real. What about the kids? Still. Was this the first one or the second one? Uh, both, actually. Oh. First one actually just got a color TV the other one. But wow. besides my myriad of successes in my personal life, thank you for watching Sports Zone. I'm your host, Ben Florence. We will see you next year. So, good to do.